Good afternoon. Usually I say good evening. I'm sorry. This is so odd, unusual for us. So first and foremost, I have a couple of very quick commercials. You've already heard most of them, I think. But this program is very special to us this, this day. Not only do I absolutely adore this author, but more important than that, this is our first foray of having an author in the afternoon. And the director specifically asked me this morning to make sure that you all had evaluations at your seat because we really want to know how you like afternoon author programs. If you like them, if you don't like them, if you think we should not do them again, if you think we should continue to do them, please let us know. Elizabeth, who has been here before, reminded me that the last time she was here was the middle of winter, a snowy, cold night, and there was a full house when she was here. So despite the fact of not having a full house, you guys have to extra specially make her feel welcome today. Um, and I would tell you, she is a Californian, so she literally um, is flying out of here pretty quickly. And for her to be in a cold February in Ohio... Now, if you recall, she has written a, uh, several phenomenal books. The one that I fell in love with was her immediate past book, which was called The Perfect Horse, which is when she was here. Was it a year ago? A year and a half ago, she came for that book, which is a nonfiction book, and it's the history of the lippets on her horses. She has written other books, both fiction and nonfiction. But this one was particularly interesting in a foray into fiction for her. When she was here in Hudson previously, she told me she was writing a story about um, Wizard of Oz. And I have read this book already. I absolutely loved it. If you are at all interested, please consider purchasing or checking out a copy. And as a hint, I will tell you very strongly, if you go out into the lobby, there's a display of all of our authors that are visiting. And when I checked about 45 minutes ago, her book on CD of um, Finding Dorothy is located right there. So you could literally check it out today if you wanted to do the book on CD. Um, if you have cell phones, please mute them as a courtesy to the author. You guys all have heard this. Thank you to the Learned Owl, which is in the back of the room selling books. Um, I had them bring coffee, and I think they're bringing cookies too here so that you guys could warm up afterwards and visit with Elizabeth as she signs the books. Don't forget there's a donation box on the wall. I hope that most of you have picked up those little blue brochures about upcoming authors to Hudson. I have told many people in the last 24 hours to look at the April 30th program. Um, we have had the honor and the wonderful luck to book a gentleman named Andrew McCabe, who is all over the news yesterday and today. So if you are at all interested in attending that, I strongly recommend you go to the desk today and register because many people are obviously interested in registering and it will probably fill up before the end of the day. There are other great authors in that brochure, all of which I strongly recommend. I've read every book in that brochure and I can tell you honestly, I enjoyed all of them. Um, this one though is one of my favorites. And you guys have to bug Elizabeth afterwards to find out what she's writing next since I haven't had an opportunity. But this woman is wonderful, and without further ado, because you don't want to hear me, listen to Elizabeth Letts. So where is your famous Ohio cold? <laughs> Two weeks ago, I missed it. You know, and I, I packed heavy because I was sure I'd be freezing. Honestly, I, I, I was delayed leaving San Diego because of weather. And it was raining. <laughs> and I was scoffing, saying, why can't the planes fly when it rains? But I guess it was windy or something. But apparently in San Diego, when it rains, they uh, can't fly the planes. So <laughs> the last time I was here, there was this beautiful snowstorm. And I thought I maybe was going to get caught here, but we kind of got in and out. But here in Ohio, a, a couple feet or two of snow apparently doesn't deter you. Um, so the rain in San Diego, I'm sure, wouldn't have faced any of you. So I'm really excited to be here. I came in 2017, and I liked it so much. Gwen said, well, when you write a new book, I'll have you back. And I really didn't expect to be back so soon, but it's such a beautiful town, and I'm sure you know that you're blessed with one of the most beautiful libraries that I've ever visited. So um, I was eager to come back, and I'm excited to be here today. 
So my book, Finding Dorothy, is uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today. But before I start talking about Finding Dorothy, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my journey to becoming a writer, because it's really, in a way, relevant to this story. So I got a late start as a writer. I um, was a very, very avid reader as a child. And I, I spent all my days in the library uh, with a mother who was also a very big reader. And we went to the library, checked out. My mother always said I could check out as many books as I wanted to. And so I would lug home 13 or 15 books. And I would read all of them. And I knew from the time I was quite young that I wanted to be a writer. And um, so, but I didn't exactly know how to go about that. Uh, so I went to college, and I didn't major in English. I majored in history because I liked stories, and I realized that English was about analyzing stories, and history was about reading stories and learning stories. And then I graduated, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm only 21 years old. I, I don't know what would I write about. I don't, I don't have much life experience. So I joined the Peace Corps, and I went to Morocco for uh, three years, uh, and I taught English. And then I got out, and I still hadn't written anything, and I still... You know, but I still had this idea in my mind. And so but then it occurred to me that I was going to have to earn a living. And I didn't have any marketable skills. <laughs> so I thought, well, what will I do? I'm gonna, I think I'll go back to school and uh, study nursing. I decided that nursing, I thought it would be a good career for somebody who wanted to be a writer because I thought that I could kind of, it, this, is, this was how my fantasy worked. I was going to work like a nursing shift somewhere near the ocean in this beautiful place, I don't know where, and I would have this big Victorian house, and it would have a view over the ocean, and I would go work my shift and come home and write my novels. Are there any nurses in the room? <laughs> How do you think that worked out for me? <laughs> yeah, so I, I went to nursing school. I became a certified nurse midwife, and I, and I worked as a nurse midwife 60, 70, 80 hour weeks for a long time while I was raising a family. I have four children. And all that time I was still convinced that I was going to be a writer. That was my destiny. While I drove to soccer practice and cooked meals and did the things that moms do. And it was, it was the year that I turned 40. One of my best friends from college called me up and we were chatting and she said, guess what Elizabeth? I wrote a book. And Instead of feeling happy for it, I was wild with jealousy. I was like, that can't be. I'm the creative writing girl. I'm the one who's going to be a writer. That can't be. And that was when I sat down and wrote my first book. So 2000. So this is writing is actually my third career. And I kept working as a nurse midwife all the way up until 2013, 2014 is when I retired. So it was pretty recently. So I wrote my first four books while still raising my children and working full time. And the reason I'm telling you this story, because when I start to tell you a little bit about Finding Dorothy, you'll see why that story resonated with me right away. Uh, because Frank Baum, uh, the author of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, published his, that book in, when he was 44. After a long career of doing many things, most of them very poorly, you know, he kind of, from pillar to post, tried a lot of different careers and none of them really worked out. And then when he published The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, it actually was a giant bestseller. It was kind of like, if you would imagine the way that the Harry Potter series is now, it was, that's what this was for the early 20th century. And he was an overnight success at the age of 44. And so I really, I, I really related to Frank um, because it was hard for me. It was hard for me to kind of carve out the time and say, no, this is really something I want to do. And, I've heard women writers talk about their incredibly supportive husbands who got up at four o'clock in the morning and wrote little loving notes on the coffee maker. And you know, I love my husband so much, he's a wonderful man, but no, he didn't do that for me. <laughs> you know, he was like, what, he was like, what are you doing, Elizabeth? You've, you've got a career, you've got kids, you, we've got a full life, we can barely function as it is, two jobs. Why do you want to write books? And I, the only answer was just like, because I want to. But it wasn't easy for me. It was quite hard. It was hard for me to carve out that time. And it was hard for me to, honestly, to have the courage to do it because I felt kind of stupid. I would be like, oh, like, I want to write books. And that didn't make any sense to anybody. Or I guess people thought maybe it was kind of a hobby. So, um, 
So that's what I want to say about myself, and that's the, that's the life story that I brought to the story that I wrote, Finding Dorothy. So Finding Dorothy, the, the, way that I, the way that I found it, so this is the 80th anniversary of the Wizard of Oz movie. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen it. <laughs> right. Raise your hand if you saw it on network TV the first time. Yeah, everybody around my age, we remember. Do you remember that? You know, you would, it would come around once a year. And back in the day, you, when you had to wait, <laughs> if you wanted to see a movie, you had to wait. And so it would come, and it was kind of the beginning of that special season. So you would, The Wizard of Oz around Thanksgiving, and you remember the Jiffy Pop popcorn that always burned, all the stuff? <laughs> and so in my family, we, we would watch it every single year, and then it would be after that, you would get into your Rudolph, and your Charlie Brown Christmas, and everything like that. So what's interesting about The Wizard of Oz, it came out in 1939. And at the time, MGM was interested in making a fantasy film because Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs had been a gigantic hit for Disney. But as you all know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was an animated film. So nobody knew if, a, if you could really make a fantasy in, on film with real act, live action characters. Now we have CGI. Now they know how to do absolutely everything on film. They can make anything happen. But that, back then it was a question. How would you make a house fly in the air? How would you have a lion uh, you know, speak? Could you really bring a fantasy world alive? They weren't sure. But Louis B. Mayer, you know, the, he was the head of MGM. He was a big, big dreaming man, and he thought they could do it. And so what he chose for that first fantasy was, at the time, America's most beloved, well-known children's story, The Wizard of Oz. And um, it came, lavish, lavish budget. It came out in 1939 to modest box office success. It was not the highest grossing film of 1939. Does anyone know what that was? Right. So Wizard of Oz came in, came in second. And it had a second life, though, when in 1956 they started to put it on TV. And that was when every year for about 30 years, until the mid-'80s when you know Blockbuster and everything came along, uh, it, came, it came around every single year. So by the end of that time, in spite of its mediocre box office in the beginning, it had become the most viewed film of all time. Um, it's certainly the most viewed film of all time by Elizabeth Letts. I don't know how many times I've seen it. Ha raise your hand if you've seen it more than once. Pretty much everybody. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's with that's with the film. I also read the book as a child, and I don't remember it all that well. Uh, but I decided to read it to my son as a bedtime story about six or seven years ago, and. That was when it really struck me. So you know how you reread something, you reread either a, a children's book or maybe you watch, let's say you watch Toy Story as an adult with your, with your kids or your grandkids and you realize that there's this whole level that the children aren't going to understand. So when I reread The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, that's what happened to me. I was reading it and I thought, there's, what, what is this book? It's really funny, it's witty, and it's kind of almost a little bit subversive, the mentality who wrote this book? Who is L. Frank Baum? Where did he get this very modern outlook um, as a 19th century man? It, the book was published in 1900. And so I did what I do when I'm curious about something. I just popped his name into Google. And that was when I discovered that Frank Baum had, a really, had dedicated the book to his wife, Maud. And that his wife, Maud, was quite a powerful character in her own right one of the first women to attend an Ivy League school. She went to Cornell in the 18, uh, early 1880s. And Frank Baum's mother-in-law was a woman by the name of Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was, at the time, she was a very, very famous and radical advocate for the rights of women, and she was a, um, a suffragette. And so Matilda Jocelyn Gage, she was actually such close friends with Susan B. Anthony that uh, her daughter Maud called Susan B. Anthony Auntie Susan. And Susan B. Anthony stayed at their house so often that she would carve her name. She actually carved her name in the glass. That house is now a museum. You can actually go see Susan B. Anthony's name in it. So, um, so I was like, OK, I get it. You know, Frank Baum, he was a cool guy because he was married to this cool woman. And he had this cool mother-in-law. And he had this, this modern outlook. The end. I shut down the computer and went back to working on my horse book. Except that a while later, somehow I came across a, a photograph. 
And the photograph was a photograph of Maude Baum with Judy Garland on the set of the movie at MGM in 1939. And it just hit me like a thunderbolt. There is an actual living link between the man who wrote the book, who died in 1919, and the movie, which was filmed in 1939, and it's his wife, and the story was dedicated to her. And so that was when I thought to myself, this is a story, maybe this is a story. So I start, I pop it back into Google. You know, Maude and Judy, Maude and Judy. I get almost nothing. And, and that was when I, I realized, okay, not only is there a story here, but this story is going to be historical fiction, not nonfiction, because there are certain stories that you can really only tell properly through fiction. But that was what drew me to the story. And in particular, I want you to kind of picture, um, and if you just go, if you go home and you Google Maude and Judy, you will, find, you will be able to see the picture. Maude was 78, Judy was 15. Maude obviously had this burning desire to protect the legacy of the wonderful Wizard of Oz not just because she wanted to protect her husband's legacy, but because it was really their legacy together. The story, as you will see when you read Finding Dorothy, was very much drawn from the experience of this long and very eventful and sometimes quite difficult life that they had led together. It was as much her story as it was his. But also, she was the last person alive who really knew the story's secrets. But now think about if you're her. I find, even at my age, that it, sometimes it can be hard for women to make themselves heard, especially older women. Now go back to the 1930s and imagine that you're Maude and you're 78 and you're going to try to make yourself heard at MGM Studios and the person you need to listen to you is Louis B. Mayer. How on earth would that happen? And then I thought about Judy. Judy at the time was 15. And we now know how difficult the studio system was and is, well, the movie business is on women even today, but particularly back then. And she was young and she was vulnerable. It's very well documented that she suffered quite a lot of abuse during the time that she was a child star and that she, we all know that she really had ended up having a tragic life, the roots of which started back then when she was in the studio. And so Judy sings this song about Over the Rainbow and, I mean, raise your hand if you just die every time you hear that song, because I know I do. And, and, but think, I mean, I want you to just stop and think about it for a minute. She was 15. She was 15. And the, the voice that, that she gives voice to this spirit of hope that is so mature and deep. I can't think of another place in all of cinema where you'll, you're really going to have that distillation of hope. But she was only 15, so where did that come from? Where did she draw that out of herself? Where did she find the voice to give voice to that emotion? So those were the, those, that's the start of my story. Maud trying to make herself heard, Judy trying to make herself heard. So I do want to say a little something about the fact that this is historical fiction. And I don't know if any of you have read my previous books, but my last two books, The $80 Champion and The Perfect Horse, they were both nonfiction. Um, and I do get a question very often, what's the, how do you write historical fiction? What are the rules? Does anybody wonder about that? Do you guys ever think, like, you're writing about real people. How do you decide what, what's true and what's not true? Yes? Feedback? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so I, I was on a panel in New York um, a few weeks ago, and there were several authors on the panel. We had all written this same kind of book. One of them featured Eleanor Roosevelt. One of them featured Winston Churchill. And we all had different answers to that question about what you're allowed to make up and what you're not allowed to make up. And that's because as soon as you say that something is fiction, you really can make up anything. I mean, I could say that Frank Baum was, uh, was Russian and that the land of Oz um, actually was a real place. I mean, if, once it's fiction, you can do whatever you want as long as your reader will believe you. But my philosophy in writing historical fiction is taken from my philosophy of writing history, which is that I think that I owe it to you, the reader, to not make up facts that are known. So if, 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 if something happened 
that is going to be, I'm going to stick to that. But if there's no way to know what happened, because sometimes we don't know. History is very frustrating when you're writing history. You can get up to a certain point, and it doesn't matter how many documents you read, you can't find what were they thinking at that time. And historical um, writers like me, we have all these kind of techniques that we use in history to make you not notice that we didn't know. Um, you know, you can set people into scenes, but you can't make anything up. And there's a bibliography and there are footnotes at the back so you know exactly where I got everything. But historical fiction does. It allows you to push open that door and to, to say, well, if I don't know exactly what happened, I don't know what they said to each other, then I'm allowed to make that up. And you, the reader, you're the arbiters of whether that worked or not. Because if I'm not true to my characters and they don't seem real, you are going to uh, throw the book across the room. I mean, I know I've done that a few times. But when you're reading it, it seems like it's right, and then you get to this point and it's like just so wrong. Um, you won't believe it and you won't read it. So um, the past is, in a way, a little bit like the Land of Oz. Because Frank Baum actually believed that the Land of Oz was a real place, and that you could just, it was there, and it was the fact that we couldn't see it. It was our own defect that we couldn't see it. If we could just kind of push aside the veil, it would be right there in front of us. He never thought that it was really a fantasy land. And the past, think about it. You cannot go and visit the past, except through your imagination. Even if you live through it, right? Even if you think about this, like you, you're thinking back to the first time you saw The Wizard of Oz and you're imagining your couch and all of a sudden you can't remember if it was a floral couch or was it the leather one that you got after and you don't know when. You can only visit the past in your imagination but you visit the past through reading on a scaffolding of facts that the writer builds for you. And the more the writer puts into the research and the more the writer builds that story, the easier it is for you to go visit. And I hope when you go there that it's not exactly like what you thought, that you learn and that it's something new. That you visit it and you think, I thought I knew, but it's really not quite what I thought. So, the last thing that I want to talk about is my own experience with The Wizard of Oz seeing the movie. And so, do, do you guys know what a spotlight memory is? Have you ever heard that term? It's uh, when somebody has a, either something very traumatic happen to them or something very vivid. So something that happens in the news, like you heard uh, that the president was assassinated, and you can remember exactly where you were. Or if something terrible happened, like you were in a car accident, and you have this very, very vivid memory, and then sometimes everything around that memory is kind of a little vague. Do you, has, do you guys relate to that? So I have a spotlight memory of the first time that I saw The Wizard of Oz. And uh, when I was real little, we lived in Houston, Texas. And do you remember when nobody had color TVs? We didn't have a color TV, but the TV store was trying to peddle their brand new, beautiful color RCA TVs. And so they came up with this idea that they were going to open the doors of the TV store and invite the local families to come in. And my family went. We went into the TV store. We sat down on the rug, and we watched The Wizard of Oz on this brand new color TV. And I have never forgotten that moment at all. Um, I think. I believe, looking back, that I was probably traumatized <laughs> because, I don't know, everybody's scared of, okay, were you most scared, raise your hand if you were most scared of the flying monkeys. <laughs> yeah. How about the witch? So, well, I was actually most scared of, you know, you know the, oh, ee, oh. <laughs> I was terrified of them. So, I do vividly, vividly remember this movie and seeing it, the experience, and I know I was only four because we moved when I was five, so, um, but that memory, the other part of the piece that I remember too, is that ever after that, I had an imaginary friend named Dorothy. And I played with her all the time. And she had a sidekick. And her sidekick was named Mr. Nothing Boob. <laughs> and Mr. Nothing Boob had a light bulb in his head. And so whenever he had an idea, which was infrequently, this light bulb would go on. And, and then Dorothy and I would basically just boss him around. <laughs> So I was a middle child with an older brother and a younger brother, so you can kind of imagine where that might have come from. But I really, I really identified with Dorothy, and that's, that's been the case now that I've written this book. So many people have told me they were Dorothy in the play, they dressed up as Dorothy in Halloween, just, you know, this, this kind of connection. And why? What did I like about Dorothy? It was because she was brave. 
So when there's a scene in The Wizard of Oz where um, she, they first encounter the Cowardly Lion, and he starts to bully, and he bullies Toto. Do you guys remember that scene? And she goes up to him, and she says, pick on someone your own size. And then when she goes, and the first time they see the wizard, and he's got that big, you know, fiery head, and, and the, they're all the scarecrow, and they're all trembling, and Dorothy is the one who finally gets mad and says, you promised, you said if we brought you the, the broomstick, you would do it for us, and she speaks up. And, and, and of course, she liquidates the witch. So that's why I think, I'm sure, that that is what it was about Dorothy that I admired. But what really was meaningful to me was when I started to do the research for Finding Dorothy, and I went back into the story, and I found the story of Frank Baum and Maud Baum and their mother-in-law, Matilda, and their life, and how much of that went into the story of The Wizard of Oz. And that Maud was alive and worked as a consultant on the film and really did have an influence. That's when I realized that that, that idea of equality for women, that wasn't, that wasn't just something that I pulled out of it, that was put into the story on purpose by Frank Baum, and it's part of the story's DNA. The secret hidden message of The Wizard of Oz, the movie, and The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, the book, is girl power. So thank you. And I'd be happy to take questions. Yes? You know what, I didn't know, she was she originally from Cleveland? I actually didn't pick, I didn't know that. Yeah. She lived in uh, New York. No. <laughs> Actually, this Margaret Hamilton, what's interesting about Margaret Hamilton is that she was the only person who was nice to Judy on the set. She was, um, Judy, the, the men were very much concerned about being upstaged by her, um, and especially the, the, the uh, three, you know, the, the lion and the, the tin man and the Carolyn Lyon and the, I'm sorry, the Scarecrow. They, um, yeah, they were big vaudeville per performers. They were quite famous at the time, and Judy was a girl and she was unknown. And they, they weren't actually really that happy with the idea that she might upstage them. They didn't like that. But Margaret Hamilton really was a kind person. She loved children, and she was a well-educated woman, and she went out of her way to be kind to Judy and be friendly with her. That was really the only uh, actor on the set of the movie that Judy got close to. So... Yes. Uh, I love the horse books, and I wonder what the background is on the $80 uh, story. How I got connected to it? Yeah. Oh, I actually, this was my first book, The $80 Champion, which I'm really excited because it's actually going to be made into a movie. So um, it's been kind of in the pipeline for a long time, but it's actually going to go into production. So um, at MGM Studios, as it happens. <laughs> Um, but my, I didn't, I was a, a rider growing up, I was a horse girl, and um, I rode a uh, hunter jumper and I did three day eventing, but I had no, I had never heard the story of Snowman that I tell in that book. Um, I had just, I found, it was actually really similar to how I found this one. I found a picture of Snowman and Harry DeLayer, and there's a, it's a picture, there's a horse uh, jumping over another horse with a rider on it, and I wanted to know what the story was behind it, and I, when I realized that it, what an interesting story it was. I'd never written nonfiction at the time. My, I had started out as a fiction writer, and I didn't really know how to do it, but I was talking to my uh, literary agent, and I said, I found this really great story, and I feel really inspired by it, but I, I have no idea how you write nonfiction. And he said, well, why don't you try to figure it out? So I did, and then I, I ended up uh, writing that book, but that's how I found it. More questions? It, it, yeah, that's a great question. Fairly well. I mean, some of it is actually really, really similar, but it does definitely depart in certain places. As with almost every book, um, the book is longer, and the, the sequence of events is somewhat different. So the main difference, the most significant difference between the film and the book, in terms of, I guess, the spirit of the book, is that, you know how at the end, Dorothy wakes up, and she, it seems like maybe the whole thing was a dream? But in the book, I mean, Frank Baum was absolutely not thinking that this was, it, Oz was a real place that you could come and go from. And so he, he I think that's the one, the one thing, and I, I actually, in Finding Dorothy, I don't really discuss that very much, um, but I think that's the one place where the book departs in a way that maybe he wouldn't have liked. 
Um, in in the have it, did any of you see the the two thousand what was it two thousand and six movie Oz? Um, there was a, a follow up book, and they did take a few of the scenes. There's the dainty China country um, in the book where they go through this land that's all made of China, and things keep breaking. And actually, you'll if you read. Finding Dorothy, you'll find out what part of Frank Baum's life that came from. If you read Finding Dorothy, you'll, and I'm not very explicit about it, so I hope that part of the fun of reading the book is kind of, um, you know, uncovering it for yourself. I don't ever say, and then this, you know, you sort of should realize it as you're going along. Because when you write fiction, you know, you, you do draw inspiration from real life, but it's never like a one-to-one -one exact thing. Um, but I hope you will enjoy tracking the clues that you find as you're reading through the book. Yes? What else did Frank Baum write? Was anything else successful? Well, he wrote, I mean, it kind of broke my heart. So, <laughs> honestly, it broke my heart. Uh, is there any writer who ever didn't die broke? I don't know. So Frank Baum, actually this is so sad, he did write 14 sequels to The Wizard of Oz. There was a whole series. The, the book is called The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, so I'm kind of going back and forth. But. Um, he didn't, he, when he wrote it, he really didn't want to write a lot more Oz books. I think he wrote, I don't remember exactly how many, I think maybe four or five. And then he, he and he had these fans, they were insane. He would get uh, fan letters by the, by the wheelbarrow full. And he decided that he was going to um, take everybody to Oz, leave them there, and then he told all the, you know, his fans that the radio connection between Oz and, and the rest of the world had gone down and he wasn't going to be able to write any more Oz books. So he wrote all of these other books, just book after book, many under pen names, including he wrote under some female pen names. Uh, he wrote adventure stories for girls under female pen names. Um, but none of the books were ever as successful as the Oz series. And so this is the part, though, that really broke my heart. Um, he, well, he was a bad businessman. Maude was, was good. Maude was practical and she was very smart, but Frank was kind of a flake. And he got really, really interested in motion picture. Frank Baum, he started out with photography when it was brand new. And then he, he, he was able to imagine, he was kind of a futurist type person. He was able to imagine that there was going to be motion pictures long before they really were able to um, be made the way that they were later. And he started out in 1910, and he did this traveling show. It was called The Fairy Log and Radio Play. Now this is before radio even existed, so radio I guess at that time meant something far out. It didn't actually mean like the way we think of radio. And they used these hand painted slides that he had to have them painted in, they were like magic lantern slides, painted in France. And then he took this show on tour and it actually had this kind of, it was the first, really one of the very first times that it was like a stage show, but also with this moving picture he sort of looked like he was stepping out of the book wearing this big long white tuxedo and everything and um, and it was I guess in motion picture history it's considered one of the very first like precursors to film but it was so expensive to put this show on that he actually um, went bankrupt bankrupted his family and then Maud actually had to assign the rights to that very first book the wonderful wizard of Oz to his creditors so he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote through the end of his life. When he died, there were still, he had just really finished writing the last book of the ones that he wrote, and there was one left that was in a safe deposit box that they, that they published a year later. And um, then after he died, there were actually even more that were written by somebody else, um, uh, Ruth Plumley Thompson, yes. And, um, so that she was engaged by, she was chosen and engaged by Maude to keep the series going. So um, that's, that's, that struck me as, you know, poignant. But, but I mean, I think that that definitely, there's a kind of a genius. There was a genius in him that he was able to, um, you know, come up with this world. And especially with The Wizard of Oz, I think it's got this timeless quality. The Smithsonian called it America's first homegrown fairy tale. And... It, it, you, can't, you can't even really imagine that somebody made this stuff up. It seems like it's always been there, right? Like Cinderella and the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and, and the Tin Man. You don't think, oh, somebody made that up. That was what drew me into the story. I was like, 
well, somebody made it up. Let's learn something about him. Let's find out what. Yes, go ahead. Did you reconnect with any of the involved descendants? I didn't. <coughs> Excuse me. I did not. No. Yes. <clears throat> did any of your research reveal the origin of the name Frank used for the land of Oz, where it came up with? The there were a lot of different stories. Um, and one that's very popular, which I, I didn't, didn't really believe. Um, but again, there's really no way to know. So this, he was writing fiction, um, but there were, there have been a number of different things. One of the things that was said in an interview was that he looked up and saw a filing cabinet and that it was, that he saw O to Z and that that's where he took it from. That could be true, I don't really know. Um, <clears throat> but when I was doing research, there were a lot of different stories and even Frank Baum himself, he was, um, he was a real raconteur, so if you, if you read interviews with Frank, um, you would find him saying a bunch of different things at different times. So um, I, you'll see, in, if you read the book, you'll find out which one I decided to land on um, as the inspiration for it, but uh, I don't think we'll ever know for sure. Thank you. Yes. Well, that's actually true. That um, what happened? They actually hired Buddy Epson to play the Tin Man originally, um, and Buddy Epson was a very famous actor at the time. And, and they were using aluminum on as part of the to color his face, and it caused him to have a, a, a very severe allergic reaction. Or I'm not even sure it's allergic. I mean, he, he was breathing it in, and he was so severely compromised that for a while he was in an iron lung, and obviously he recovered, but not in time to, um, to actually appear in the movie, so they replaced him. Yeah, and uh, the other person who was injured was um, the, wi the Wicked Witch, uh, Margaret Hamilton was also injured. Uh, she was burned, uh -huh. and so she, she was burned when they were filming that scene, and um, she, she did recover and was able to be in the film, but it was crazy, like I said, they were making up the special effects as they went along. They, had, they, they didn't know, they would try all these different things. They didn't know how they were gonna make a cyclone, how they were gonna make the house go up in the air, how they were gonna do any of these things. Um, and that was because, uh, you know, I guess they just had that confidence that they thought they would be able to do it, and, and, and they did, so. Is there any credence? I remember reading long ago that actually in this, uh, uh, that bomb had a uh, hidden message, and it was a political. The populism? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is there, do you put any credence in that? I, you know, it, it, I, thought, I was, thought that was an appealing theory, and it, it certainly sort of made sense for the, uh, the place and time, kind of, but when I looked into it, it didn't seem to be the other, I should say that I was writing historical fiction, but I, I had the uh, distinct advantage of the fact that Frank Baum and his life has been very, very well studied and very well documented. Um, and if you, in the back of the book, there's an author's note where I talk about how I did the research for the book, and I give credit to a lot of the books. So if you want to delve further into his own life and his inspirations, and I think they do talk about that, um, there's, there's quite a lot of factual information about, about Frank, about and about Matilda because she was this is his mother-in-law she was quite famous and there's quite a bit about Maud also um, so there's a lot of factual documentation to, to draw from I also did original research um, I was able to locate some things that really haven't been used much um, up until now in particular there's a diary that was kept by Maud's sister who was a homesteader in North Dakota and um, so she, she had kept this very, very detailed diary of her life when she was there, and it was in, a, in the North Dakota Historical Society. And so I pulled that out, and I took a lot of information from that. But in general, the basic facts of their lives, it's definitely, I would encourage you, if you read my book, to then read more about it. It's so interesting. Do we have time for uh, more questions? Or OK. Anyone else have a question? Yes. So um, I can probably assume that you wrote your first books and then how you got an agent or so that you had something How I got published? Yeah. Oh, well, my very first book that I wrote, I wrote it um, 
back when my friend called me up. I was able to find an agent for that book, and she tried to sell it, but she wasn't able to sell it. So it was the next book that I already had an agent, and I wrote, an, I, I wrote another novel, and then she sold my second. The first, second book I wrote was the first book that I sold. Um, so that's how, and I just got a, I got an agent just, just the old fashioned way, which is like, I didn't have any particular connections. I didn't, I imagined, well, I loved books and writers, and I imagined this kind of Truman Capote, you know, they're all in New York, and they're all having cocktails together, and one says, do you want to meet my agent? And I'm thinking, well, what am I gonna do? Because there's no agents around here where I live. But actually, I just, I just got books and read about how you, book, how you get an agent, and I, just went through the process of submitting and getting rejected. And you have to have a very thick skin because you get rejected all the time. And if you're me, you immediately think it's because I'm not good enough, you know? And you can't, you have to just, you have to believe in yourself and you have to keep trying, trying. And sometimes when I think back to my early career, it's a miracle that I didn't quit because it was kind of depressing. You know, you think it's gonna be overnight success, but really there's a lot of slogging that goes on before anybody's interested in anything you have to say, but you have to believe in yourself. So that's why I, I tried it. That's really kind of one of my most important messages is I feel like whenever I go out and talk to people, everybody in the room always has something, their thing. It might not be writing. It could be, it could be a hobby or a trip that you want to take or just something that you is really important to you. And so many of us, we've spent a lot of our lives doing things for other people. And it can be really hard to take that back and say, I'm doing things for other people, but I also, this thing is important to me. I don't care if it sounds silly or trivial to you. I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, because I feel like if I did it, that's, that's true, it's true for you too. And I, I hope if you would take away anything from L. Frank Baum's life and my life, it's that it's worth doing something even if you kind of were slow getting around to it and aren't sure it's a really good idea, just go for it. People say, why are you doing that? Just tell them to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can have, I guess, one more question. Yes? When you part of a local writer's group, so you get immediate feedback when you have written chapters or you network with people, and then you have to go I think writer's groups are really, really great, but I was not. Um, and. Actually, interestingly enough, so this is way back in 2000, I did get involved in this online group that was called Writer's Net, and it was sort of this wild west. This is back when we had to dial up to the internet. And so, like anybody who, it, it, there was like millions, of, lots of people, and many of them were probably, I don't know, they seemed kind of crazy. But some of the people were not crazy. And eventually we got together and we formed a, a it was still an online group, but it was um, private, and so, we, in the beginning, we all used pen names, I mean fake names, and we got to know each other. Many of those people have gone on to be successful writers whose names you would recognize. Um, and the, but the, the group doesn't really exist anymore, but now we're actually real friends in real life and, 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 and that. So we never, interestingly though, we never exchanged manuscripts. We, we exchanged information about how, to, how did the publishing industry work. Well, I sent a letter to this agent and he didn't even answer. Well, he didn't answer me either. You know, that kind of thing, like business kind of stuff. Um, for writing for critique, I, my, my first reader has always been my mom, who was that same avid reader that I told you that has um, you know, dragged me to the library. She reads, she has macular degeneration, so she can't read anymore, but she listens to audiobooks now, and she will literally sit and let me read the same page 27 times if I want to. She barely ever says anything. And most of the time she says, oh, it's so good. But if she says something, I listen, because she's really astute. So, you know, that, that, she's really my only critic. Um, I didn't really have anyone. This book, my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, who's 24, got really interested in reading it. And that was the, a first for me, that she um, had some interesting feedback for me, too. But most of the time I was kind of on my own, which is hard. Yeah. Yes. I have another book that's in progress. And so, um, actually, it, I was telling Gwen, but I think this is actually kind of funny. I was a fiction writer, and then I started writing nonfiction. My fiction books you've never heard of, because nobody bought them. And <laughs> my nonfiction books, one of them was a number one bestseller, the other one was also a you know, New York Times bestseller. They were very successful. Publishers like what works. 
And so that was it. Elizabeth left. She writes nonfiction about horses, period, the end. And I was, I sold another book, which is another true story about horses. And I, I do love these stories. I, don't get me wrong. I really do. Um, but in meanwhile, I had been kind of secretly writing this book, thinking, but I love fiction, and I really love this book. I really want to do it. And once I was on the phone with my editor, and she's very, actually very well known for this type of book. Um, I don't know if you guys have read like The Paris Wife uh, was one of her books. So she's, she's somebody who really specializes in these true life stories of women. And I'm on the phone with her and she says, I said, oh, I hate writing nonfiction. It's so hard. I'd really like to go back to fiction. And she says, oh, no, don't do fiction. There's so many people writing fiction. Stick with your nonfiction. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm three quarters of the way through this book. <laughs> So I gave it to her, and I think, I honestly think she was a little slow to respond. I actually think she was thinking like, oh, no, no. But then, when she finally read it, she loved it. And then my publisher got really excited about it. They decided to flip the order. So instead of doing my book, my horse book next, um, they decided to do this one. So the next book is another horse story. Um, and it's a, it, it's a true story from the 1950s about a woman who faced a life-threatening diagnosis of cancer. And she lived up in rural Maine and uh, her, had a farm that had just been foreclosed on. And so she decided to try to ride her horse from Maine to California. Wow. And that's what the story's about. So, okay, I think that's probably it. But thank you so much. I appreciate all your questions.